the, usually my topics are really covering more sort of the high level discussions around cybersecurity. It's not really product related or anything uh, related to that. I've been in this industry for a, a very long time and I've also been able to work with some very interesting people on some very interesting projects. And, and over time, what I've learned to understand is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is that you know, generally across the board, we're really struggling with uh, cybersecurity and all the things that are going on there. I'm just going to bounce through through these next set of slides real quick, just to kind of give a little bit of a, um, a backstory on what the nation states are doing. If you're not familiar with the concept of advanced persistent threats, um, they're uh, you know awkwardly uh, the acronym known as uh, APTs. And these are really strictly around uh, nation states. They have groups within those nations that are either you know part of the military or they're sponsored by the the, the government themselves. And they have different functions, like with North Korea, for instance, I'm most familiar with the Lazarus group uh, right here. They were responsible for the Sony hack, but they were also responsible mostly for actually breaking into the banks around the world. And their whole intent is to actually steal money. The stealing of the money is designed to actually pay for their nuclear ambitions. And so that particular, particular group is actually set up for that specific purpose. Uh, in Russia, we've got the Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear, and also the Internet Research Agency. Those are the people that are creating these sock puppets. They're creating fake websites, you know, trying to do whatever they can to provide misinformation and disinformation for a particular country. And it really is a problem. Um, I just read this recently about uh, CrowdStrike actually came out. Uh, what their study was, they found that, you know, these guys were behind 60%, 67% of the state-sponsored attacks. And when you look at the amount of uh, groups that they have working with them, you can see how this correlates uh, right here. These are the people that are actually trying to break into your organizations as government uh, institutions. You are a prime target for these guys. You know, we're familiar with the solar winds that happened earlier on this year. You know, one of the things that I took from this and reading it is I don't really understand how so many of these organizations were compromised by this malware which was designed to put in a back door into there. Uh, and nobody d discovered the fact that the, uh, you know, these guys were had a presence within the network. And so they, again, were able to achieve persistence. Um, you know, it was discovered toward the end of last year. One of the reports that I read said it, it could have started as early as uh, early 2019. So that was almost like a year and a half into uh, inside these organizations before anybody detected it. Again, a failure in process. We're familiar with also what happened with these guys. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of credential stuffing, but this is a, the, uh, when these guys buy your credentials off the dark web, they put them into a tool which runs across the entire digital domain looking for matches. Unfortunately, what uh, users are tending to do is that they use the same credentials over and over again. So these credentials are in, you know, the same credentials they use at work. They also use at Facebook and Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. And these bad guys, they know this. And so they'll take your credentials, they'll run them across all of the accounts that, uh, on Facebook and everything else, and they'll, they they found a batch with these guys. So on the one hand, it was sort of a self-inflicted uh, scenario, but on the other side, you know, without multi-factor authentication, there was no way to protect these accounts. Now, of course, you go on the website and it's a wash in, in there. Uh, another area where, you know, you're familiar with is uh, Stuxnet. Uh, that was a, a weaponized malware that was designed to disrupt the centrifuges from building, you know, creating enriched uranium. Um, it was also in, in helping with uh, bringing the Iranians to the table, actually, to negotiate uh, how they uh, actually created uh, uranium and so put some controls around that. And then, of course, there was the colonial pipeline that happened this year. Uh, the ransomware, it didn't take down the pipelines themselves, but it was the offices that uh, were affected by this, but out of an abundance of caution, they shut down the pipelines until they investigated this. But some reports actually said that they were told that they had issues even two years before. Again, a failure of process. They all have technologies. One thing you might not be aware of is in, in back, I've read about this account of maybe about three times in the last 15 years. Um, I've read about the fact that the CIA had inserted malware into some control software for pipelines that the, they knew that the Russians were interested in stealing. Uh, and the idea was behind it was as a, uh, designed as a logic bomb. Uh, and it actually did uh, disrupt the pipeline uh, where it was intended to, and it created an explosion, the equivalent of a three kiloton bomb. 
Now, whether we, you believe that story or not, the point is, is that because you can see failures like that, you know, and based on what we understand about Stuxnet, these are we're, we're being attacked from all different kinds of uh, areas. And so it's really going to take a concerted effort by, you know, a larger part of the community to come together to really try to understand how we can, you know, inject cybersecurity as a culture right across the board and not just in the domain of a few people. Um, this was an example of how the uh, the North Koreans actually, you know, steal money from a bank. They were the ones that were discovered uh, that actually stole $81 million from the Bank of Bangladesh. They nearly got away with $1 billion, but there were some discrepancies in the way they had injected themselves into the process. Uh, you know, they made some spelling mistakes and there were some other things that uh, people were able to determine that, you know, these payments weren't real. But again, this is an example of persistence. They get into your network, they learn about your processes around payment, and then they start injecting themselves into that process. Uh, and this event actually happened with the city of Burlington a couple of years ago. We don't really know who was behind that. Maybe they do, but um, this was a very similar thing. They lost $500,000. Uh, it took them two weeks to figure out that it even happened before law enforcement uh, was brought in. So it literally can happen with anybody. And I know that they were building out their security practice at the time. But this is a very difficult thing to uh, to pick up anyway. Um, I'm going to skip past uh, some of these. I'm just going to jump to these guys here. This is an example of a fish tank controller that was available on the internet. <clears throat> it was something that was exposed, uh, and uh, the casino suffered a major catastrophe as a result of being hacked and breached. As a result, and it was done through a fish tank. They managed to tunnel their way in from the fish tank into the network and caused a lot of damage in there as well. And then there was these guys. <clears throat> uh, some bright spark decided to take a selfie, uh, uploaded that picture to Facebook, not realizing that the pictures at the time were geotagged. And so the insurgents were able to download these pictures uh, and figure out where they were, and they put the information into their mortars, and they destroyed four out of the six brand new helicopters that had just been uh, delivered. Now. In our world, where this is really affecting us is that the predators amongst us also figured this out as well. Uh, and this is how they managed to uh, to figure out where their next victims were going to be, because they just downloaded these pictures. And if you think about it, too, like you could literally plot a person's entire life just from those pictures from Facebook. So you need to make sure that I can see nowadays that the geotagging is turned off, but it's something that you definitely need to pay attention to. Um, this is a real thing. Uh, this wireless aerial surveillance platform is a GPS guided, fully uh, AI driven hacking slashing machine. You can park this thing outside of a building. We actually have one of these. We've never used it uh, because we're, we have a, a fully AI driven penetration testing service uh, in the back end. And it literally does everything a human would do uh, when it comes to the kill chain attack uh, methodology. And so you can train a, an AI-based engine to be able to do these types of things. This can act as a cell phone tower to intercept all your calls. It can act, you know, have uh, you can set up websites on it, fake websites that people would go to and, and put in their credentials. Or they can act as a man in the middle as well to decrypt your uh, uh, SSL communications. And then of course, we know about Nortel. Uh, this is an example of a nation state persistence. They were in there for 10 years and basically contributed towards the destruction of that company. I'm going to show you some examples of what it looks like to hack you as an individual. I have an account on this website. It's actually supposed to be used for research, uh, but it's basically an entire uh, it's a da an database of an entire listing of corporations and companies and organizations uh, that have things that are advertised on the internet or they're visible to you on the internet. You know, if I run a vulnerability scan on your on your external interfaces or external network uh, on the internet, it's going to come back and tell me, you know, what ports you have open, what websites you have, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are listed in there. Nobody's sitting around wondering what, you know, what's IT blueprint up to today. <clears throat> They've already scanned you. They already know what you have available uh, on the internet. And so just to give you an example of the types of things that you can do in there, I just put in the acronym RDP. And it came up with thousands and thousands of entries of RDP connections that are actually exposed to the internet. And in this particular example right here, it's actually showing me the names of the people who have accounts on that VPN. 
I've taken away the uh, the last names of all these things, and obviously to protect the innocent. But this is literally what's visible on the internet to these guys, to you. So unless you're actually doing these things on a regular basis to make sure that you're not exposed like this, they can use this information to actually hack your uh, VPNs. There was a, an announcement that came out just rec just recently about um, the uh, vulnerabilities that were associated with VPNs for one of the major vendors that. Uh, uh, firewall vendors actually and so this is the reason why these are the types of things that the inf and information that these guys can and can get from you in order to hack your environment so it, you know in a case like this it doesn't really matter how expensive the firewall was that you bought if you're just exposing your rdp connections to the internet you're just a really a, a prime target for these guys <clears throat> and part of my research you know i turned on my vpn i actually plugged in the ip address uh, of that into my uh, remote desktop client. <clears throat> and sure enough, I was able to get access to the, the login prompt. I, I really need to stress here what I'm looking at. This is your Active Directory server that's supposed to be on inside of your network is available to anybody on the internet. I now just have to find the right credentials for this and I'm on your, on, on your uh, network. So all of the practice and all of the stuff that you bought in order to make sure that you're secure, is really rendered useless because of this, this type of practice. Again, not following inter industry best practices. Another example of this, I just typed in the word camera, up came thousands and thousands of internet cameras available on the internet. Um, I just randomly chose a, an IP address. Of course, I masked it for to protect the innocent. Um, I found out which uh, particular webcam it was based on the login page. I looked up on the internet what the default uh, credentials were and boom, I was in. <clears throat> and this is what I was able to see. Now, if I'm a predator, I can actually study your pattern of life. You know, you know, I, I learned to understand like, are you a family? Are you a couple? Are you a single person? I then used GeoLookup to figure out where in the world this particular camera was. And then I did a, a virtual tour of the neighborhood looking for the building for this camera. This is, you know, and depending on what I buy as a service next on the dark web, it could be that I'm waiting for you to go out or I could be waiting for you to come home. This guy here, you uh, definitely want to be careful of this uh, little guy here. You he may look uh, cuddly and cute and stuff, uh, but he actually really looks like this or something like this. If you're not familiar with the uh, concept of pineapple hacking, <clears throat> this is exactly the reason why you never ever do personal uh, communications to the bank or anything that's personal to you in a public space. <clears throat> this is called a pineapple. And the whole idea with this is it can actually intercept your communications in say a coffee shop or in, or in the airport uh, and decrypt those communications and actually uh, start studying the in the clear data. So if you're putting in usernames and passwords for your bank account, you know, putting in what the two-factor authentication word might be, it's gonna pick up all this stuff. Um, it can even act as a website pretending to be, you know, giving you free access. You know, you go in there thinking it's the free uh, Wi-Fi for a particular organization. <clears throat> you put in your credentials in there, you open up the website, and really what you're doing is activating the communications between you and this device as well. So when you're in a coffee shop, anybody in that coffee shop, they can be carrying one of these in their backpack. And so it's really, really dangerous. It actually can intercept your cell uh, phone calls as well. So you just really be, need to be really careful. If you've ever heard, um, you know, people saying don't do that type of stuff in a in a in a public place, this guy is the reason why. And then there's SIM swapping. This is really is a a, a problem in itself. If you're using your phone number uh, to do password recovery in, in any of your accounts, my recommendation is to to not do that anymore because. These guys are really clever. For some reason, they're able to dupe these telephone companies into uh, giving them your phone number, pretending that they're you. How they do it, it's so many new, numerous ways that they're able to do it. They then just go onto a website, they click on you know, password reset, it sends a nice code for you, don't tell anybody the code, they're now into your account. And this happens all the time. And once they're in your accounts, this is why you hear pe about people on Facebook, for instance, you know, getting defamed or defaced, uh, you know, people sending uh, erroneous stuff to their friends. This is how they do it in, in some cases. And so I've actually removed all my phone numbers and they're starting to use an authentication app instead. <clears throat> I just wanted to, this is the last thing I wanted to show you. 
you know, as it relates to the way people hack your uh, your environments. And we do this thing called dark web monitoring. It's been around for, a, a, you know, a number of years now. But the idea is that we take your domain and we'll plug it into our dark web monitoring system. And it will go through the dark web looking for hits on your domain. Um, at, at the very least, what it's going to provide is kind of like the email address for that domain and also an encrypted password right here. But it also can, can include things like, you know, if, if your passport information is in the dark web, your driving license, uh, you know, any number of different types of documents that you might have that may have been stolen in a, a particular uh, breach that could have happened, you know, a month ago or even months ago. On the very left hand side here is usually another column that has the email address. <clears throat> but I've taken that away, obviously, again, to protect the innocent. Uh, and just for kicks, sometimes I'll grab a handful of these um, and, and run this piece of it through a password cracking tool. This is what your password looks like when it's encrypted. This is what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to be protected. It's supposed to be secure. I ran it through the password cracking tool. There was about 20 of them in this particular batch. And in about three seconds, I had all the passwords. What I can do with this is I can take that email and that password, go into Office 365, now I'm on your uh, email. I send a phishing email to somebody else in your network, <clears throat> in your uh, on your contacts. They click on that link, download a backdoor. Now I'm in your network. I then download all the tools that I need to map your network out. And this is how persistence starts. This is just one example of that. Your firewall wasn't going to help you with that. But be an expert in your processes around the way you look after your, your environment. That's what's going to save you from these things. And this happens all the time, unfortunately. Um, how, you know, how would you like to be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, listening to a man screaming in your kid's bedroom because your uh, baby monitor was connected to the Internet and had the default credentials on there? This actually happened to a couple. So what we really have across the board, and again, I'm not referring to anybody that's on this uh, presentation right now. It's just generally what we see out there in, in, in the world is we're not really following industry best practice. What we're following is sort of industry best guessing. And this is what's uh, uh, killing us in terms of the being hacked and breached and ransomware and all these types of things. We've got to get clever with this stuff. Really what we're, uh, one of the things that we're really missing, again, if you take it up to another higher level, is we really need more international cooperation in terms of how we deal with cybersecurity. Right now, what's happening is we're really at the mercy of you know, ourselves. Like we're, we're left alone to really deal with these things on our own as individual organizations. What we really need is more international cooperation to actually put rules in place, kind of like a, an international legal framework as such to basically say to these you know, nation states that you can be held accountable. Uh, for allowing these criminal groups to do what they do. You know, you need to be saying things like, yeah, hospitals are off limits. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, creating life-saving, uh, um, you know, drugs, you know, those guys are off limits. We need some kind of international cooperation for this because the way we're going right now, even if you're following industry best practices, it's not a silver bullet. But what it's designed to do is to try to put as many obstacles in place to stop uh, these guys from getting access to your, your environments. You're trying to make it as difficult as possible for them because they're really just looking for the, um, you know, the low hanging fruit to be able to get access to these uh, different uh, organizations and different you know, assets that you have. Um, the US actually commissioned this uh, report uh, last year. They put together a task force. It's an 81 page report. It was sent to me by a friend of mine who's the chief data scientist for Mimecast because he heard me complaining about the fact that all we have right now is instead of having a carrot and stick type of scenario where we're rewarding companies or providing incentive for companies to adopt good cybersecurity practices, all we have right now is a stick in terms of finding them into oblivion like they do with GDPR. It's not very useful. It's not very inventive. Um, and, it's, and we need a lot more inventive stuff. This is just like some example of uh, examples of what's in the report. You know, raising a priority for ransomware within the intelligence community, you know, designating it as a national security threat, which it is. It is a national security threat. Um, exerting pressure on nation states that act as safe havens. You know, we went after the Taliban because they were uh, harboring uh, terrorists. This is really no different in that respect because you've got uh, countries that are harboring these cyber criminals and allowing them to do the things that they do. And they're doing it with impunity. 
Like there are no repercussions for this. That you know we're paying the price uh, over and over. We're either losing businesses or we're losing money. People are losing their jobs. There's, there's a lot of damage that's being done with it, and there's really no repercussions right now. This has to change. So what are we talking about when we talk about you know best practices? These are cybersecurity frameworks. There's like NIST. There's the Center for Internet Security, National Institute of Standards and Technology. There's also the ISO 27000 series. There's things like PCI. These are all examples of uh, industry frameworks that you should be following. It's not telling you what you should buy in terms of technology. That's still uh, entirely up to you in terms of what you do. And it's not saying that you need to follow those things 100% either. The whole idea is to provide you the options of things that you should be aware of so you can make good decisions around what you actually do to manage those technologies and make use of them in the best way possible. <clears throat> and it's done in a hierarchical kind of structure. At the very top of the hierarchy is what they, what they, uh, they, they uh, are these things here, it's called the functions or the major functions. And so identify, protect, detect, respond and recover. These two here are identifying the things in your environment that the hackers might be interested in. Like, what are they after? Well, what are the crown jewels that you have that they might be interested in? And then you put in protections in order to protect those. Now, we're pretty much failing at all of these things, uh, in all honesty. Uh, but where we're really failing mostly is in the detection and the response piece. We're failing to detect the fact that people are in our networks. When I hear you know, organizations telling me that, you know, we've never been hacked, so we must be good. You don't know whether you've been hacked or not, right? These don't, guys don't show up, you know, as a with a marching band and one of those really annoying uh, Vuvu sailors and saying, "Hey, you know, we're here." Like stealth is is the is you know their bread and butter. This is how they manage to do what they do and they manage to get away with what they do what they're doing. We need to have and follow these practices and do better detection and response uh, for these things. This is an example of what we're talking about uh, in terms of you know the frameworks. These categories here, I'm not going to go into every single one of these. Some of these you might be familiar with, like security awareness training and skills training. What it's really talking about is these are all the areas that you are at risk. These are designed for you to understand if I'm a cyber criminal, what are the areas and things that I should be looking at in your organization to be able to break your defenses? This is designed to teach you. It's a really good education, by the way, instead of going to an education course go through an assessment on one of these things and you'll learn tons and in fact everybody would learn a lot uh, from going through one of these things but these are all of the areas that you really need to look at in order to uh, create your defenses being able to segment your networks for instance and do a proper good job of that making sure you're designing uh, networks on a need to know basis that you're doing security awareness skills training uh, for everybody in the organization because it's kind of pointless putting in all this stuff if you're not training everybody to understand where the risks are. That's what the, the whole purpose of this is. And at a high level, it's really a straightforward process. You do an assessment to find out where your gaps are. You roll that into the remediation and develop a proper plan around how you address these gaps. And then eventually that rolls into the management of all these things. And this is where our expertise is, in fact, and how we're helping organizations already is to sort of navigate this, uh, this process uh, because it is a real challenge for a lot of organizations, as I've discovered, to be able to figure out, okay, I've got all this information about where my gaps are, but what do we do now? And so that's really where our expertise comes in, is being able to guide those things. Um, insurance is going to be another uh, major uh, factor in all of the organization's considerations. You know, insurance companies have taken a real shellacking over the last few years because they really had no idea how to, uh, you know, uh, create the... Uh, uh, the premiums that you're supposed to be paying because they had no uh, historical data to really base base that on. Uh, but they're working towards more um, the idea that I think, and I think where they're going to end up with is you have to have provable security practices in place before you can even get insurance. Uh, and they're even going to go as far as getting an audit done of your environment before they can even decide whether, whether they're going to issue insurance. And so using insurance companies to remove the risk from you to them is not going to be a thing for you in the future anyway. You really need to, to develop a strategic roadmap. It's so, so important for the future of uh, protecting uh, our infrastructure. And, you know, every citizen in the country you know, deserves to have their data protected um, and their privacy protected. And this is the way you do it. And that's it.